Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1 as we begin this new book this morning. We'll be in 1 Peter, first chapter, first verse. And if I were to ask you who wrote 1 Peter, of course, everyone would unanimously say Peter. It says right there in the first word in chapter 1, verse 1, it says it's Peter. Uh, however, there are some scholars that question what's called the Petrine authorship uh, because uh, due to... Um, you know, Peter was just no fisherman. He didn't have any kind of formal education, and they didn't see how somebody with his background could have penned um, something as uh, eloquent as First Peter. And I don't really think that's a valid criticism. Uh, I, not everyone has been blessed to have the higher education that I've had, uh, and that shouldn't be a hold. I mean, I made it all the way through 12 years of, of uh, public school. So, uh, I mean, sometimes when uh, I, I'm... Uh, in a pastoral gathering of some kind, you know, I'm talking to another pastor, and sometimes I'll get asked that question about, they'll say it, always say it this way, where did you receive your training? And I just very proudly say, Wichita North High School class of 69, go Redskins. You know, that's, that's where I got my education. So, uh, you know, whether Peter had any formal background or not, we need to remember 19, one of the greatest 19th century uh, theologians, the greatest theologian of the 19th century was Spurgeon. He had no higher education. One of the greatest ones of the 20th century was Tozer. You guys hear me quote the two of them uh, quite often. He had no higher education. So we need to remember when we're looking at the book who the author was. You know, the author was the Holy Spirit, uh, and he just happened to use a guy like uh, Peter. There was just a little background before we jump into it. There was what's known as the Great Fire of Rome. You know, uh, around here in Oklahoma, I was talking to somebody recently, and I said, uh, you know, in Oklahoma, it, it, they were talking, asking about the tornadoes and stuff. And I said, well, you know, in Oklahoma, we just, they, they said something about the really big one, the one back in, in May 3rd, 1999. That's still, I said, still, 20 years later, we call that the May 3rd tornado. You know, it just, you say that around here and everybody knows what you're talking about. Well, back in Rome, if you just said the Great Fire, they knew the one you were talking about. It was in July uh, of uh, the year 64. And uh, scholars are somewhat divided as to what Nero's, motivation was he was the Caesar at that time but he almost immediately uh, began blaming the Christians for the cause of this fire most accounts believe that he was probably trying to shift blame away from him and so he blamed it on the Christians and that began a very swift and widespread persecution that is known oftentimes as just the first great church persecution uh, and Peter first Peter was written during that time period shortly after the the uh, persecution and dispersion of the Christians from Rome began. And then he wrote Second Peter uh, uh, about a... There we go. Okay, and then he wrote Second Peter uh, about a year later, around AD 66 or 67, uh, and shortly before his martyrdom. He was martyred right before uh, Nero was assassinated. And um, Peter provides, I think... I mean, I, I really love the character of Peter. I love the books of First and Second Peter, but I love the man, the character of Peter himself. He provides such a great po profile of a New Testament individual, I think. Um, I mean, you know, Peter's mainly known for he would shoot off the lip and then ask questions later. Uh, he, his, his mouth was always in gay, uh, gear long before his brain was. And um, there are a lot of those that relate to that. They say, yeah, I dig Peter because, you know, I'm, I'm a lot that way too. I'm, I really can relate to him uh, because he is such a flawed man and I am such a flawed man. And I get that and I understand that. But before we gain too much comfort in our identification with Peter, we need to also recognize a couple of facts. Peter learned from his mistakes you know, he grew through them, and First Peter is going to be a good example of that. And then uh, secondly, remember, there were, even in, in when Peter was at the height of his uh, sticking his mouth, uh, foot in his mouth phase, he walked on water too. And, and so, uh, you know, Peter is a very interesting uh, character study, I think, of a man of faith and how he grows in it. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 1. Follow along with me as we read these first 12 verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So a very pregnant opening 12 verses of First Peter. Uh, you know, Christian, our uh, youth pastor here at the church, he was up here doing the announcements earlier, and he, he was recently asked to do a funeral uh, by a local funeral director. He was uh, asked to do the committal service. And it was going to be a graveside service for this homeless man who had died and didn't have any friends or relatives or, or any other local contacts. And, and the cemetery was a brand new cemetery way out in the boonies. Uh, and Christian was driving. He left early, plenty early to get there, but he wasn't real familiar with the area. It was very rural. And he got lost. So being a typical guy, he wasn't going to ask for directions. And so he kept driving around and driving around until finally he arrived at the cemetery. It's a brand new cemetery. This guy was going to be the first one interred there. And he saw that the, uh, he was an hour late by the time he got there. The work crew was there. The backhoe was there. Uh, in fact, they were all sitting there eating their lunches. The hearse was already gone. And he was feeling very embarrassed by it. Uh, but he stepped up to the side of the grave and noticed that the the concrete lid had already been slid over in, in, uh, in place. And he assured the workers that he was only going to take a moment, but he thought it would be uh, the proper thing to do for him to say a few words. And so the workers, sandwiches in hand, stood up and kind of gathered around him as he began. And as he preached, he began pouring out his heart and soul. I mean, he really got fired up. And even the workers themselves began saying, well, glory. Praise the Lord and amen. And this kind of fueled Christian to go even further. And so he started in Genesis and he preached all the way through the end of Revelation. And I mean, he preached for one hour. He preached for two hours. And finally, after two hours and 45 minutes, he closed in prayer. And saying goodbye to the workmen, he began walking toward his car, feeling that he had done his duty and that uh, he could now live leave with a, he had this renewed sense of, of uh, purpose and dedication in spite of his tardiness, in, in spite of the bad beginning. He thought he had redeemed himself. And just as he opened the car door, he heard one of the workers say to another, you know, I've been putting in 20, uh, septic tanks for nigh on 20 years, and I ain't never seen nothing like that before. That could have been an illustration of Peter, I think. You know, he could have done something. In fact, we could probably insert any of our names into that, and we could say there was a bumper sticker that was very popular several years ago, be patient, God isn't finished with me yet. And aren't you glad for that? I mean, aren't you thankful that God uh, isn't done, uh, that he has, he said in, uh, uh, that Paul said that that work that he's begun, he's going to be faithful to complete I wonder how many times Peter said that from the, the time that he was initially, initially called while a fisherman up in Galilee until the time of his martyrdom uh, some 30 plus years later. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, these places that he mentions here, these five places, they are 
uh, some uh, territories of the Roman Empire, uh, provinces or sub-provinces of uh, what was known as Asia Minor in those days. Today, it's known as Turkey. Turkey's been in the news a lot lately, and, and he, he is addressing to uh, these Christians that are in the uh, dispersion. In fact, the word dispersion here in the original language is diaspora, and you can see the word spore in that. It means to cast a seed. And, and they had been cast out of Rome and spread throughout the Roman Empire. And Peter was writing this uh, letter to encourage them. It says uh, they were pilgrims. Uh, if you got the New American Standard, uh, there we go. Um, new battery, and it's still not working. Uh, new American Standard says aliens. Now, not this kind of alien, you know, not, not that kind of alien, but as the King James and NIV says, strangers. Uh, they just mean people that aren't local. Uh, you know, where the Christian church had gone to, uh, people uh, that they had gone to would say, you ain't from around here, are you? Because uh, they were strangers in a strange land. And he says in verse 2, they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Notice the Trinity here in uh, verse 2. Um, first of all, you have God the Father. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We'll talk about that a little bit. Then the sanctification of the Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit doing His sanctifying work. We're going to talk about that more as well. And then he says, by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that also. The, got the Father, the Spirit, and the Son all in cooperation here in verse 2, working out our salvation. The word elect, that's kind of a buzzword. I mean, you say that within many church circles, and that immediately gets people's attention. You know, there are churches that have been formed just around this word elect. Um, and what does it mean? You know, well, the word elect in the original language, New Testament language, is the word eklektos. Our English word just comes straight over from it. And it means to choose. It just simply means to choose. We could insert the word chosen for the word elect. Be the, means the same thing. You know, we find ourselves in an election year. In a few weeks, we're going to be going to the polls. Have you heard about that? You heard about elections coming up? Yeah. In, in a few weeks, we're going to be going to the polls to choose some new governmental leaders. Uh, and uh, for some reason, it has gotten into the heads of some people that whenever you see the word elect in the New Testament, it means that you are uh, uh, made to be uh, uh, saved, that you're chosen, you're a, a elected or predestined or uh, God ordained you to be saved. And I would challenge somebody to find that in the New Testament, really. I don't really see that any place in the Bible. Uh, you know, it says here that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Uh, and, and the word foreknowledge in, in the original language is the word prognosis. Our, our English word prognosis comes straight from that. It's a direct uh, transliteration of it. And if we stop and think about it, if we think about God, you know, we were just singing that song a few minutes ago about before there was time and space and there was God. And, and uh, you know, he didn't create space to put things in. There was no, I mean, he, there wasn't space to put things in. He created the space. And there wasn't time. He created the time uh, for it all to exist in. Time and space are both creations of God. And so he dwells not, he's not bigger than the universe. He's just outside of the universe. He's transcendent of time and space. And so when we use a word like foreknowledge, to know before, and that's what the word prognosis means, if we use that word, that's really kind of like a, a that, that's a word that the Holy Spirit uses for our benefit because we're not transcendent. We are stuck in this time and space thing. And, and so when the Bible speaks of God's foreknowledge, that's for our benefit. It doesn't mean, I mean, God doesn't have foreknowledge. He just has knowledge. God doesn't know things before they happen. He just knows. He knows everything because there's not a before or after in God. You know, I don't know if you guys are football people or not, but yesterday was kind of a crazy day in college football. You know, five of the top team, top ten teams went down yesterday, half of the top ten. Um, that, that would have been a crazy day for the bookmakers, you know, the guys that bet on that sort of thing. I mean, I just... Uh, could you imagine if somebody, who, who could have predicted that five of the top team college teams would have lost yesterday? 
Well, God could have. <laughs> God, God could have made a killing. You know, he could have gone to Vegas and made a killing yesterday if he wanted to, and it wouldn't have been gambling, you know, because he's God. I mean, there wouldn't be any risk in it. You know, it'd been, uh, but, you know, when we speak of God's foreknowledge, it just means God knows. You know, it, what it means is that God doesn't have to watch the evening news to find out what happened that day and to make some sort of decision on what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, think about this for a second. I just ask you to think about this because we think. And when I said think about this, you thought, okay, what's he going to say? I'm going to think about whatever it is he's about to say. Does God think? You know, you guys are thinking right now because you're wondering what I'm going to say next, but God doesn't wonder what I'm going to say next. God doesn't think you know, like there's thoughts that he hasn't thought of yet. He's kind of working through it as we go through it. There are some guys that try to say that, but that's not true. God doesn't think. He just knows. He knows absolutely. I mean, what does God need to learn? How does God, what, what, God doesn't need to learn what I'm going to say in a few seconds or what you're going to hear in a few seconds. God already knows. You know, the Dow took a bit of a tumble this week. Was God looking the other way when that happened? Was he not in charge, you know, when your 401k sued for a little bit? Does God really care who wins a football game? Sherry asked me that one time. Uh, you know, I commented about some football player taking the, was, was praying after uh, the touchdown had been made. And she says, does God really care about a football game? And I said, well, yeah, if it's OU. But other than that, not. I mean, he doesn't care other than that. Uh, but yeah, if it's the Sooners, uh, but you know, does, does he get, it, is God going to be surprised when he sees who makes it to heaven? We will, you know, <laughs> you made it. And then you'll be looking at me and saying, and you made it. I mean, we'll be surprised. We'll be blown away, but God won't be because he already knows before the foundations of the world. God knew that that's what his foreknowledge means. And, and we are all part of, you know, it says that we are the chosen, the elected. We are chosen according to his foreknowledge, according to his knowledge, we have been chosen. You know, we, we, are, we are all part of God's plan. We're not arbitrary. We're not random. Uh, we're not afterthoughts. We're not accidents. Regardless of the physical way that you arrived here on earth or how you ended up being here in uh, the church service this morning, that's all, God had that all figured out before it ever began. You know, when it talks about salvation, he says that we, we have been, uh, uh, you know, elect according to the foreknowledge of God and, and sanctification of the Spirit for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And all of that speaks of salvation. And as it speaks of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it speaks of past, present, and future. Uh, you know, it speaks of the past where God and His foreknowledge and the present of the uh, uh, working of the Holy Spirit, sanctification of the Holy Spirit, it speaks of the future when we will stand before God uh, because we've been washed in the blood or sprinkled by the blood. Uh, there are three aspects I think we can uh, look at salvation. We can speak of it as past, present, and future as well. The New Testament does. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand by which you are, and it says, you are, present tense, saved. Uh, you know, from the very instant we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, the Lord declares us justified. That's what 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 is saying. You, maybe you've heard the, the, the thing is just as if I'd never sinned. And, and uh, you know, he declares us justified. He takes this, this old, gnarly, ratty, dork vomit rags of our own uh, bad, dirty deeds, and he conforms us into the image, of, or he tra transforms us into the image of Jesus. He clothes us with Jesus' white robes of righteousness. And when God looks at us, from the moment that we say, God, I surrender, from that time forward, God looks at us and he sees Jesus because we're justified. But the Bible also speaks about our future uh, glorification. Uh, it says also in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so there, this speaks of some future time 
when, uh, as the, the uh, old hymn says, and our faith becomes sight, our faith gives way to sight. Today we trust that this is going to happen by faith, but the day will happen when we will see him face to face and we will know as we are known. And it won't be by faith anymore. It will be by sight. And that's when we uh, leave this earth and receive our new glorified bodies, our new uh, transformed bodies, the bodies that are fit for heaven. These bodies are fit for earth. The new bodies will be fit for heaven. And we go to be with him for all eternity. That's still future. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 15 that we, will, or, 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 uh, that we will be saved. But then lastly, also in 1 Corinthians, the Bible speaks of our sanctification. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And, and that's the, the, the transforming work that happens from the moment we say, Dear Jesus, I surrender to you. Please come into my heart until the time that we are glorified and go to meet with him in heaven. There is a work that the Holy Spirit does that never ends where he is day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, transforming us, sanctifying us into the image of Jesus. And, and, and so that's where these three... The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come in, I think, uh, in uh, verse 2. Notice it says sprinkling and not washing. You know, we talk a lot, the Bible speaks of us being washed in the blood, and we sing the hymns, the, you know, the old classic hymnology speaks of being washed in the blood, and it's a beautiful, I think, dear concept. But it speaks of sprinkling here, not washing. Uh, it's not talking about baptism. It's not sprinkling versus immersion. Uh, but it says sprinkling. The pl three places where the Old Testament, under the old economy, where it speaks of sprinkling. Uh, one is in Exodus chapter 24 when the covenant was initiated, when, they, when they, God first made his covenant with Israel and he gave them the law. And the, the people, the congregation was sprinkled. Aaron made the sacrifice and then they, he took the blood and it was sprinkled symbolically, sprinkled on the people. Uh, and, of course, that's, that speaks of us today as we are the congregation uh, of God. We are the body of Christ. And, and then uh, other place where it speaks of it is when the priesthood was anointed in Exodus chapter 29, where the priests, the Aaronic sons of Aaron and Aaron, were sprinkled with the blood to anoint them into the priesthood, beginning the uh, Aaronic Levitical priesthood. And they were sprinkled. And, and then lastly, in Leviticus chapter 14, we are told that in the case of a leper who is cleansed of his leprosy, he is to go to the priest, and the priest is to check him out, not to go to the doctor, you know, not to go to the ER, but go to the priest, and the priest would declare him free, cleansed of his leprosy, and then the priest would sprinkle him with the blood of the sacrifice. Interesting. You know, we are the congregation of God. Uh, Peter's going to tell us later that we're a, a royal priesthood. And, and it, it, we have been, because we are a royal priesthood, uh, we are a royal priest, priesthood because we have been cleansed of the sin of uh, uh, the leprosy of sin. And it, it, we've been set free from that. We've been cleansed from that. And so the sprinkling uh, of the blood of Jesus speaks, I think, in all three of the Old Testament examples uh, to us. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It says we, he has begotten us again. Uh, the first New Testament, first century word for that is anagoneo. The first part of it, ana, is the prefix for uh, again. And then geneo is the word, for, you know, our word genetics and genesis and genes and so forth comes from that. It means to be born. Anagoneo just literally means to be born again. Uh, it's not the same word that we see in John chapter 3. Remember when Nicodemus comes to Jesus? Uh, at night, and he says, we know that you're from God because nobody can do the stuff you do unless God had sent him. And, and Jesus, instead of thanking him for the compliment, you know, well, I'm glad you've noticed, you know, that I'm from God. I appreciate that, uh, Nick. You, you did good. He just looks at him, and, and without batting an eye, he says, you must be born again. 
It says in John chapter 3, you must be born again. John 3, 3. Uh, now, the word born again there, uh, the Latin word for born again, the Latin word, if we were reading Latin Bibles, our text uh, here in, in 1 Peter 1, 3 would say uh, regenero, regenerate. Sometimes it, people who, who are uh, born again, they talk about be, being regenerated. The same, same meaning, same idea. But in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, he's talking to Nicodemus, and he says, Unless someone is born again, he can't see the kingdom. And that's a different word. It's got, got the word ganao in it that means to be born. But then the second word, mean, uh, nothen, can mean again, or it can also mean from above. And we can say, well, which one is it? In John 3, 3, does it mean that we are born again or we are born from above? Yeah. <laughs> both meanings fit. I mean, it's both. We are born from above and we are born again. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the truth, or the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is an absolute statement, okay? Either it's true or false. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Uh, now, an absolute statement is either true or false. Right? I mean, an absolute statement can't be both true and false. It wouldn't be an absolute statement. In fact, that statement, an absolute statement is either true or false, is an absolute statement. Uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, th it cannot be both. That's an absolute statement. Um, and the uh, uh, significance of this is there are those today that will say there are no such things as that. There are no absolute statements. Uh, many of the college campuses... Uh, many professors, of, regardless of what the, the, the class may be, regardless of what the discipline or the subject may be, you'll hear college professors all, across America today proclaim there are no absolute statements. That's an absolute statement. If, if, if somebody ever tells you there are no absolute statements, then ask them, are you absolutely sure? You know, I mean, it, it, it's either that's an absolute statement. So either that's a true statement. It's either true that there are no absolute statements. And if it's true, then it's false. Because there are absolute statements. So uh, here's why this is important. This is why this is significant. How do we know when Peter is addressing his letter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where he addresses it to those who are begotten of the Father, how do we know that being born again, as Jesus said in John 14, 6, is the only way? That going through him, that Jesus is the only way. How do we know that? Uh, there's a difference between what we call objective truth and subjective truth, okay? Let me explain. You say, I didn't come to church to have a philosophy state, uh, uh, class. Well, uh, this is important, though. Let me, let me explain. Uh, an objective truth is going to be empirical. It's measurable. It is demonstrable. It's something that you can, you can look at and you can examine and you can determine the height and width and depth, and it's something you can look at in the laboratory. That's, uh, that's what empiricism is. Empirical means something that you can demonstrate. Uh, it, 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 it is uh, founded upon fact. Two plus two is four. That's an absolute statement. Uh, but years and 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 decades and centuries and millennia of mathematicians have, have proven that to be true because every time they add two and two, it comes out four. And, and, and so uh, that's what an absolute belief is. An absolute statement is something that's founded upon fact. Whereas subjective truth is emotional. It's expressive. It, it is arousing. And I mean, you know, it stirs up the senses. It stirs us up on the inside. And it's based upon feeling. An absolute truth is based upon fact, and a subjective truth is based upon a feeling. Now, I, this is not a put down of subjective truth. This is just a, this is an absolute statement. Absolute fact is based upon fact. Subjective truth is based upon feeling. And it's logical by simple logics Subjective truth is always going to uh, uh, be the result of um, absolute truth. You can't have one without the other. Objective truth is going to lead you to subject, uh, subjective truth, but it can't be the other way around. You can't have subjective truth. You can't feel like something is true and then have it become so because you feel that it is. You understand? Uh, if, if I'm going to have any feeling about something, it's got to be first based upon the fact. 
I can't take my feeling and, and determine uh, truths from that. And so the feeling that uh, Jesus isn't the only truth, he's not the only way, truth, and life, that being born again is not the only way, that's not based upon fact, it's based upon a feeling because people don't want there to be only one way. It's not based upon an examination of facts. You know, I mean, I can, I can, no matter how hard I might try to identify as a pretty, shapely, 20-year-old blonde co-ed, I'm not, you know. Uh, I might feel, no matter how I feel, no matter what I try to declare, that, that, that kind of a, a position would be totally devoid of any kind of facts. And that sounds silly, but that's where our culture is going today. That truth is being determined by how somebody feels. And if you think about that, if you take a culture that is based upon subjective truth, based upon how somebody feels, you know, my truth is just as good as your truth, laws have no meaning. They have no purpose. Uh, the only solution, the only result of subjective truth is anarchy because there, there is no right, there is no wrong, uh, there, is, there is, you know, and why does all this matter? Why is this important? It's because we have a faith that is sliced and diced and sautéed and simmered and steeped in, in just verifiable, objective, take-it-to-the-bank truth. That's what our faith comes from. If somebody says, he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart, you ask me how I know he lives because I, I, I feel him in my heart. That's fine and dandy. But that's not going to establish truth because I feel God. The truth is going to be established because God says he's in my heart. And then maybe I might feel him there some days. And so if I'm going to react to subjective truth as opposed to objective truth, I'm going to beat my head against the wall many times over. Now, what does all this mean? If Jesus says he is the only way, he is. And if his word says that we are born again into a living hope, as our text says, then we are. Uh, it doesn't matter how we feel about it. Uh, it doesn't matter what the circumstances might say. It doesn't matter anything other than the fact that Jesus says we are born again into a living hope. Why? Because Jesus is alive. That's an objective truth. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad but they argue over where the tomb of Jesus is because the, the two main places that people argue about, and now they're saying there's possibly a third one, the reason why they don't know is because the holes are empty. <laughs> because Jesus rose. He's not in the grave. And that's an objective truth. That's, that's something that's measurable. That's something that's demonstrable. You can, you can look at that and come to an objective conclusion. Jesus is alive. He says, he says undefiled. Now, I believe I have faith in the finished fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, to me that's a settled issue. That I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that I am justified, and that as far as God is concerned, when he sees me, he sees Jesus. He sees the finished work. He, he, he doesn't view me any more differently today than he will when I'm glorified and I go to be with him because... Time has no relevance to God. That's fact. That's objective fact. When I looked in the mirror this morning, I mean, if you think I look bad now, you should see me a few hours ago. <laughs> you know, when I looked in the mirror this morning, that objective fact was not demonstrated to me. I, I did not see glorified. That's not the word that came to mind when I looked in the mirror this morning. I didn't see the finished work of Jesus in my life. I didn't feel it in my life. Uh, when, I, when I look in the mirror, I don't feel undefiled. But the Bible says I am. So am I going to go by my feelings or am I going to go by the Bible? You know, when the Bible speaks of living hope, we've got to understand, we, we've seen this many times before, but when, when the Bible speaks of hope, it's not in, in the New Testament sense of hope. It's not like we use it today like I, I hope I'm going to get a new motorcycle for my birthday, you know, I'm hoping for that. Uh, that's, you know, usually the things we hope for in that kind of sense don't happen. Uh, but when the Bible speaks of hope, it's like something that is already set in concrete. It's, it's a promise of God that just hasn't been realized yet. 
We just haven't seen it come to its fruition, but, but it's already a done deal in heaven. And when the Bible speaks of hope, that's why he can call it a living hope. It's a, it's a, it's a, a live hope. It's still alive uh, today. And, and um, so he says in this, verse 6, you greatly rejoice, uh, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. See, here's why this is important. All of these, these multitudes of, of Christians that have been dispersed out of Rome during this uh, uh, tribulation, during this dispersion, this persecution, uh, they were living in hard times. You know, I mean, they weren't in their summer villas. They, they were having a hard time uh, even just getting enough food to feed their families. And it was a very difficult time. And, and he says, uh, you know, you could, but you can greatly rejoice in the fact that it's all been taken care of, even though right now things aren't going very well. And I think that for many of us this morning, that will probably speak to you. Now, there's probably a lot of us here this morning that you can look at your circumstances, look at where things are in your life right now, and, and see a whole lot of room for improvement on many, many different levels. I mean, some a guy said one time, my idea of a vacation is a change of trials. You know, when I get a new set of trials, then I feel like I'm on a vacation. Uh, in fact, it was a few years ago, it was said that uh, there was a few things that were said about how you know you're going to have a bad day. And let me just share a few of these with you. You know you're going to have a bad day when you call the suicide prevention hotline and they put you on hold. You know, it's probably going to go downhill from there if, if, if that's the way. So, or if you see the 60 Minutes film crew show up at your office, it, it, it's probably not necessarily a good thing. You know you're about to have a bad day. If your twin sister forgets your birthday, you're probably not going to have a good day. You know that's in for your hard time if that happens. If your boss tells you you show up to work and your boss tells you not to bother taking off your coat, it's probably not going to be a good day. Or if you're driving down the highway and your horn goes off accidentally and it gets stuck on as you're trailing behind a herd of hell's angels, it's probably not going to be a good day. You know, that's probably, uh, and, you know, why does it seem that the more serious I get about my walk with the Lord, uh, the more trials I seem to face? I mean, the, 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 the more I focus my attention on Jesus, the more I, I get, like, tunnel vision on Him, uh, the more it heats up the trial meter Why is that? Verse 7 tells us that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold which perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, gold is what's known as a precious metal. In fact, some would say the most precious of the precious metals. Uh, they can uncover gold that has been lying at the bottom of the sea for centuries and is still good. Uh, gold is a pretty durable thing, that gold is. Um, but it does perish. It, it will eventually perish. And he says that, that the reason why these trials are happening is so that the genuineness of our faith, which is more precious than gold, which is going to perish, even though it's tested by fire, may be found in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. You know, years ago I had the opportunity to go. Uh, I had a friend back in my hometown, and he worked for this place. That you, you know what a flight simulator is? Uh, you know, they got all different kinds, and, and he worked for a place that did this. They did flight simulation and training uh, pilots, and, you, you know, they don't let you go up in an airplane and turn you loose at the beginning. You do it in a simulator first. And so I had the opportunity to fly a, a simulator. And uh, you got in, you know, and I mean, the, the, it's like you're sitting in a cockpit of a plane, and the windshield all turns into like this video screen. And, and I was able to take off and fly around. They even flew right through the middle of the Holiday Inn, and, and uh, uh, it was just fun. And I was able to land it. And it was kind of cool. You know, it was a rush. And it's if you've ever had the opportunity to be in one of those, I mean, you feel the G-force. You know, as you accelerate, you feel because the thing leans back a little bit and then it starts vibrating. And you actually feel being pressed back into the seat. And, and it's all the sensations of real flying, except it's just a test. It's, 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 it's just part of the training. Life is a simulator. You know, life is just, it's, it's just to train us, it's just to prepare us for what real flying is going to be like uh, when we uh, uh, find ourselves at the glory of the revelation of Jesus. 
whom you haven't seen, Peter says. And Peter had seen him. You know, P Peter understood, but the, the people that he was writing to hadn't. He says, whom you haven't seen, yet you love. Though now you don't see him, yet believing, you rejoice. And you rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible, and it's full of glory. Uh, even though he's somebody you haven't seen, you haven't touched, you haven't handled, as John said, we did. But Peter says, you guys, even though you haven't done that, you still have a joy that's beyond description. It's full of glory. And knowing that at the end of your faith, at the full end of it, when you come to the end of the road, then that faith will give way to sight, the salvation of your souls. See, faith turns sound doctrine. What we're doing right now as we go through the Bible, as we are studying 1 Peter, as we are going verse by verse through it and learning what the Holy Spirit had to say to these guys and how it applies to us, as we rightly divide the word of truth, as we break it all down, and then we apply faith to that, trusting that it's true, that results in a sound practice. Sound faith or sound doctrine plus faith results in a, in a sound uh, practice. Well, why is it, you might say, that I'm missing it. I mean, it always seems like I'm just short. I'm, I'm saved. I'm born again. I love the Lord. I'm fairly active in my church. And yet it seems like my jigsaw puzzle is always short a couple of the very crucial corner pieces. Uh, it just never does kind of fit all together. Uh, well, teaching must be mixed with faith. One without the other is dead. If, if you have uh, sound doctrine without faith, that leads to dead orthodoxy. And some of you may have come from places where you say, I understand what dead orthodoxy is. But if you have faith that's not mixed with sound doctrine, then that's like a chicken with its head cut off. You know, they both end up, uh, they're both dead. You might have a lot of activity, but that chicken's dead. And it's when we take sound uh, doctrine and mix it with faith, we can say that orthodoxy, having the straight belief becomes orthopraxy, having the straight uh, practice. The sound doctrine mixed with faith becomes the sound practice. Our joy, it says, is inexplicably tied to our faith. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I have an enemy that would like me to think that my joy is inexpress inexpressibly tied to my circumstances. And if that were the case, I would have very few joyless or joyful moments. But Paul is saying, or Peter is saying, that our joy is inexplicably tied to our, our faith, regardless of our circumstances. So we can declare, as the psalmist did in, in Psalm 25, 15, My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. As, as, as the psalmist was going through his trial, he says, I'm going to just keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord, because he'll pluck me out of this, this uh, fowler's snare. He's going, to, he's going to deliver me. He will save me. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, verse 10, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, indicating when he first testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Here's what Peter's saying. Uh, you know, the Old Testament prophets, from their vantage point, the way they were able to see things, they saw the salvation of Jesus. They saw the coming Messiah who would come, and they saw his sufferings. They saw he, how he would die on behalf of the people. They saw that. But then they also saw the millennial kingdom. They also saw the first coming and the second coming to them from their vantage point appeared to be a singular event. That was confusing to them. Uh, they had, a, I mean, not only did the Old Testament rabbis have a hard time figuring out, but the, the prophets themselves, it says, Peter says, that they kind of scratched their head about this. It's because their perspective wasn't quite the way it should have been. You know, and if they were able to see, they could see that that first coming was separated by at least 2,000 years from the second coming. Um, their depth perception issues. When I was in the military, I tried to get a military driver's license, and they gave me a depth perception test, and I failed it miserably. I couldn't get a military driver's license because of my poor depth perception. Well, the problem with the Old Testament prophets is they had poor depth perception. Uh, they couldn't see that the first and second coming were separated. To them, verse 12 says, it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. You know, Hebrews 
chapter 11, verse 40. And we'll just wrap it up with this. But it says, uh, God having provided in Hebrews chapter 11 that great hall of faith is called. And, and it goes through all of these examples of guys in the Old Testament who did this by faith and did that by faith and trusted God and this happened. And, and it says, all these guys, it says God has provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So the writer of the Hebrews is telling us that, that as he gives a lot of accolades to the Old Testament saints for their faith. He says, but we got something better than they do. Uh, he's provided something better for us so that they would not be made complete or perfect apart from us. What has God provided for us that's better than the Old Testament faithful? Well, I would say many things. Uh, and none of which, as we look at them, none of, none of which should make us prideful. As a, like, I got something you don't have. You know, it should, it should make us humble as we look at what God has provided that is better than the Old Testament saints. For example, uh, we have a broader spectrum of fulfilled prophecy that we can look back on. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, if you just use maybe Abraham as a starting point uh, of, of the promises of God when God called Abraham uh, in, in Genesis 12, the Old Testament prophets, as they looked back at how God had been faithful to fulfill His promises, uh, from starting with Abraham up until the present time, they had about 1,500 years that they could look back and say, you know what, God said it, He's, He did it. Um, and, and so they could have faith that He would continue to uh, obey His prom uh, be on, uh, faithful to His promises. Uh, we've got close to 4,000 years of perspective. From our vantage point, looking backwards, we've got a whole lot more uh, scope of fulfilled prophecy than the uh, Old Testament uh, prophets did. And additionally, we have the completed canon of Scripture. You know, we, we got the Word of God, and that's it. I mean, God says, here's what I want you to know, and I've finished it. And another thing we have is that our understanding of God's redemptive plan is historical, where theirs was uh, prophetical. You know, they looked forward to the fact that God would someday send a Redeemer. Uh, they didn't know how, when, or where, or in what fashion, but they knew that someday their Redeemer would live. Even the oldest of the prophets, Job, said that. Where ours is historical, we can look back and see that it was done. It was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Um, we are regenerated. Now, some Bible guys would disagree with me on this, but I don't believe that the Old Testament guys were. I don't think that they were regenerated, born-again individuals. I think they're saved. I think they were saved when Jesus died on the cross, but I don't think that they lived lives that were regenerated as ours are regenerated. Um, and as a result, we have uh, this understanding of a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Uh, they, they, the Holy Spirit would come upon them in order to accomplish a purpose, some sort of a deed, but sometimes He would come upon a guy and then leave a guy. Uh, we have the promise of the, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As we are regenerated, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, comes and lives inside of our he uh, hearts. And then lastly, and I think this is the most significant, we have the bride of Christ. You know, uh, this was something that, that not only the prophets, but he says even the angels themselves longed to look into. As, as Jesus was hanging there on the cross, as he was dying for our sins, and, and all of heaven was watching this. And, and, you know, they were probably in awe of the things that God had done through Jesus up to that point. And the angels were like, wow, God, this plan is awesome. Woo, boy, are you showing your grace here. And all the way up to the point where, and then when they arrested Jesus, they thought, oh, I can't wait to see what you're going to do now, God. You know, you're going you're gonna to have him bust loose of the chains and, and, and just make those Romans bow before him. And those Pharisees are going to ask for forgiveness. And, and as his passion began to unfold and they began beating him, and then uh, they took him to the place of crucifixion. And as they nailed him, to the, the angels are, had, had to be looking at this and saying, what is going on here? Surely you're going to bring him down off of that cross at any moment. Lord, you're going to have him just kind of jump off of there, and, and, and then people will see, see your glory. They longed to understand what was going on, and they couldn't see it. It was hidden to them. They could not see God's grace working in such a magnificent fashion, and then he died. And even the angels of heaven were just kind of wondering. It's not that their faith, I don't think their faith was uh, wounded by it. I don't think angels have faith. They just, they just wondered what's going on. And it was all so that he could give birth to the bride of Christ, us. And we have that. 
So as the Old Testament prophets and as the, the angels themselves long to look into it, we have that. And that can be as a, a bulwark to our faith, regardless of the circumstances we ever find ourselves facing. Amen? God, we bow before you this morning in humility, Lord, but we give you all the praise in what Jesus has done. We thank you for this vantage point that you've given us. We thank you for fulfilled prophecy. We thank you for the completed work of your scripture. We thank you for the indwelling of your spirit. We thank you that you have proven yourself to be faithful time and time and time again. You can certainly handle any of the circumstances we find ourselves in. And we can choose to have a joy that's inexpressible and full of praise for you. And so we do that. In Jesus' name, amen.